Thanks so much. What a great morning uh, and a great afternoon ahead. Uh, I think I dipped into a million interesting conversations. I'm assuming you all did as well. And I am so excited for this panel. I've uh, been reading the bios that have been available, reading up on the companies. And uh, my job is to stay out of the way. So I'm going to, uh, I think, introduce name and company first, just so that that's um, put out there again and we all have that in their mind. Um, we were instructed to give a little self-introduction of some fun, interesting fact. Is everybody ready to do that? I don't know if that got through. Everybody has your fun personal fact ready. Start thinking about it if you haven't come up with it. Um, mine is that I was the uh, first man to go through the doula training program at Seattle Midwifery School and had been present at uh, quite a number of births. So that's great. And I've officiated six weddings. So, uh, there you go. Those are both recycling related in a way, but I'll let you figure out how. Lila Horowitz, a uh, Renew designer, and Eileen Fisher Renew. Um, Evernew is not here today, just so you know, but an uh, amazing company. We've heard reference to them a couple times today. Um, I should have gone over pronunciations uh, for uh, Colin and Wilford. Seattle. Seattle? Yeah, Seattle. Okay, <laughs> thank you. With Zoom, yes. Uh, Lindsay Lawrence, who we've known for a long time, uh, with Metamorphic Gear. Uh, Kate, again, we should have rehearsed this more. So I'll let you pronounce your own last names, Casey. It's uh, Sagisi. Sagisi, okay, great. A program manager with Northwest Sound, thanks. Uh, Ruth Drew, who I've overlapped with for quite a while now, too, with New A9. Uh, Gabriel Bello Diaz uh, with uh, Fischio. And then Sue, who um, a lot of us have known for a long time, and thank you for hosting um, with REI. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to step aside. We'll let the panelists. Uh, share their fun fact with you, go through their presentation, and then I'll be fielding questions, moderating questions, trying to pull out some themes uh, as we go along. So, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, we're going to start with Lila. Am I supposed to say interesting things about myself? Absolutely. Oh, do we want to ask the Oh, okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Oh, look, that's my dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Um, I'm I'm Lila Horowitz. I am with Island Fisher Renew. Okay. And uh, let's see. I I work in um, I work for a fashion design company by day, and I am building a house by night. Um, it's been a long year and a half, and it's almost done. So that's my fun fact. Um, I I wear car parts. for about 10 years now. We are buying our garments back from our customers when they are finished with them. We offer $5 per garment on a gift card to Ivy Fisher. No matter what the condition of the piece is, um, we'll take it back as long as it's ours. This initiative is, um, there's a few, a few other companies cropping up doing this similar work. It's really exciting. We think it's the future. Um, and within that, we also see, well, so we're, we're encompassing resale and then redesign in refibrizing of the fabric, so looking at all of these kind of the full life cycle of the brand. Um, I, if if you haven't heard of this program before, sorry. I, I, hope, I hope everyone has heard of it because we have a great base here in Seattle. We have our recycling center in Soto, where we process about forty percent of the pieces that come through. So um, at this point, we are. I think we surpassed one million garments in April of this year. So that's a big moment for us. Um, One million and counting every day. We get about, let's see, I'm looking at Patty, who I worked with also, but we get about 15 on average boxes, sometimes more, depending on how close to the change of season we are. So that's kind of my first image here. Um, I just was trying to find a picture of our boxes, and it's cute with the dog in it. So we, we receive our garments from our, our store is west of the Mississippi, um, and uh, we, we open the boxes and we sort everything and we decide whether it is in first, first quality condition where it is cleaned and re 
sold in one of our stores. We have a store in Seattle, we have a store in Irvington, New York, and we have eight company stores across the country that carry our product as well. So they're at the Fisher outlet stores um, with renewed product. And then we have an online shop. Uh, anything that has a slight damage, um, we're reselling in our not quite perfect sales at a lower price point. We have a couple of these warehouse sales every year. We're developing a program where they're moving around to Portland and Bellingham on November 10th at Rack Pinery. Um, and then we have our highly damaged garments that have maybe, oh, here's, the, I just have some um, unglamorous photos of our spaces just because I think that's the really interesting work is the process around this. Um, everybody has been reselling garments and remaking garments for hundreds of years, but the fact that we're taking this on as a company and saying, we're, we're taking full responsibility for our product when our customer is done with it, and here's how we're figuring out what to do with it. So this is a sorting station, and you can see the different bags and boxes that the pieces get sorted into, depending on the quality of them. Everything has been worn for the most part, so we're not dealing with new merchandise here. We're dealing with 34 years of the brand. So we can see things from Eileen's first collection to things from this year already. Big lipstick stain on the floor in perfect condition. And everything is bagged and laundered. We work with a local dry cleaner in Seattle who we are, I think, 80% of his business now. So he's he's really tailored his work towards us, um, our high standards around green cleaning and making sure that it's as low in chemicals as close to zero as possible. Um, we too love the idea of tersis and <coughs> waterless washing, so that's hopefully in our future very soon. Um, this is our space in Irvington, New York, where we have a tiny factory, and I think um, this this is where we really get into the meat of redesigning the clothes and saying, okay, we have, a, we have a piece that is too damaged to be worn as is, so what happens to it next? It's still a really incredible textile. Um, where we are, I think I have a picture of, this is our space in Seattle? This is our um, tiny factory team, and they're remanufacturing garments. So we are designing into our patterns and, just, and, and cutting new pieces out of them. So taking a pair, I'm wearing a good example of this. Um, this tunic is made from three pairs of linen pants. And so we're, our patterns are re-engineered with seeming to be cut out of pre-existing clothing. Um, it's really looking at scalability in, in remanufacturing and taking upcycling to the next level. And this work has been happening for three years, I believe now we're in our third year with the tiny, or second year with the tiny factory and kind of third year of R&D on this. Um, and then, I don't know how much time I have. Oh, yeah, yeah, keep going. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I can talk about this all day. We all want to hear from everybody, so yeah. Okay. Um, there's a, there's a lot of multifaceted parts of how we're dealing with these clothes, and a big reason for that is because unlike a lot of um, outdoor wear brands, this is a this more of a fashion and design brand, so we have many different textiles and many different styles <coughs> that span fashion through 34 years. So we're seeing, very, very rarely are we seeing multiples of each piece, thus it makes the resale um, element of it a little bit more difficult and the, the redesign element. Um, we can kind of concentrate on certain textiles that we use a lot in the brand, so I think a lot of brands have you know, their core fabrics and their core styles that they use, and we for sure have those. The, um, you know, the heavyweight linen pants that we've been selling for 30 years and that are still so great, and when they come to a point where they can't be worn again as they are, they get cut up and sewn into a new heavyweight linen tunic. Um, so there, there's a lot of potential there, I think, um, but it's also taken a lot of retraining, and I think we've been talking a lot about sewers and you know the factory, and what does that look like in this new era of clothing and textiles. And it, for us, it's been a lot of sorting is the key thing. It's sort of the least sexy part of the business to talk about, but it's the, the core to everything. You need to look at every single garment and assess every single damage and figure out kind of what is the next best point on the circle for this piece to go. So, you know, we find 
If you can wear it again as close to the condition that it's in, that's the next best step. And if you can't go there, then what happens with it next? Does it get a slight alteration or you know a slight repair? Does it does it get completely recut into something new, or is it too far beyond that? And we're um, I don't know if I have a picture. Oh, okay. So here's here's some of our um, remade line. This is a tank that's made out of three different pairs of pants, so you can probably get about two of these tanks from those three pants. So you're seeing the seaming on there, uh, cut in a specific way, which uh, the, as designers, you really need to look at, you know, where is the seam gonna lie on the body, but also how is it gonna fit onto a pair of pants when they're deconstructed. It's kind of like a whole, um, a whole new element to the design process that really starts with our material inventory. So you can't sit there as a traditional clothing designer and dream of you know this this linen box top in your head. You really need to be looking at okay, how much material do I have? How many of this can I make? And what is the spacing in the material that I have? Because we just are working with yardage and fabric the way that we traditionally would. Um, and then this is a felted piece. This is another area that we're digging deep into exploration around, and uh, it's needle punch felting, which is a great solution for heavily damaged garments that are getting shredded and re-felted into new materials. And we're finding this an, an incredible area to start exploring. We're looking at wall hangings, more kind of architectural and industrial design elements in a lot of spaces where we're using heavyweight textiles in the home and in, um, in kind of, you know, like businesses will put them on the ceiling to help with noise reduction. So there's a lot of potential there. And as an organization, we've been digging deep into this just because even when you are making pieces like this, there's still scrap and we're committed to all of it. So we've been having um, storage units of this stuff for many, many years and we're starting to look into what happens with each and every bit of it. Oh, and then the, the last kind of, I think this is one of the last things I have on here, but this just happened in Brooklyn, I, I believe a week ago. Um, there's a, a streetwear clothing line called Public School, and there are two really cool guys, and they came, and they spent a bunch of time in our tiny factory in New York, working with our designers there, and they created a collection, and then debuted it at our new store in Brooklyn. And it's just very interesting, you know, because I mean, for sure, it's kind of a, um, not a streetwear line by any means, but we're, we're then in conversation with younger designers thinking about this kind of work. And so they, they made a hat and a, um, some cool silk glasses and some very low V-neck or you know, sweaters that you would never have on the line that are so great and super cool, all out of our um, out of our review garments that have come back with damages and can't be worn. So we're really thinking about collaboration as well and how do we begin working with other designers in this space bringing other people in to look at our textiles differently and what is kind of, you know, what is there with everyone's ideas. So I think the last thing, I just pulled this off of our website, but it's just sort of the way that we approach our thoughts around these pieces and how do we keep them in the cycle of, of use. We're saying, you know, we've committed this huge program to collecting them back, but now we need to kind of make sure that they go back out there. And, and, and these are, yeah, just little fun facts about it, but thinking about what, what are the techniques we're using as a company and how do, where do we scale that and where do we kind of find partnerships, for example. Um, over dyeing is all done with a local company called Botanical Colors. It's Kathy Hattori and she's an amazing woman in Fremont. We've been working with her for, I think, four or five years now doing these amazing, beautiful collections of indigo over dye and all kinds of great stuff. So, yeah. Um, Oh yeah, this is our team, and the, the last fun fact is it's this incredible um, woman-powered organization, so we're having lunch in our warehouse last summer. Um, but it's just a lot of really strong, innovative women working in the space currently, and it feels very exciting to us to be on the forefront of the future. Oh, me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you're gonna... Remember, fun facts. Fun facts. Okay. 
Um, I don't have an awesome PowerPoint for you, so I'm going to give you one of my most embarrassing moments. Facts. <laughs> and that is, is when I was in college and obviously broke a long time ago. I mean, the college part, the broke part, not so much. Um, <laughs> I auditioned to be on a reality show that I didn't know what it was going to be because it wouldn't tell me because there's like secrets, right? Um, and I went through this whole background check and did all this stuff, and then finally I got sat there and I was super calm, even though I still had no idea what it was. Um, then I got a job, and like, you know, a true needing to be responsible away from my parents. I was like, TV, I wasn't going to make it on TV, so I chose, I chose the job. And thankfully so, because I found out that it was, um, who wants to date a prince? And I was watching this with my best friend, and she looks at me in the middle, and my dog's on the floor, and she's like, you know, we couldn't be friends anymore if you were on this, right? <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. I also can't read my own writing, so bear with me. Uh, my name is CL, and I work at Zoomies. Um, we are, I don't are you guys familiar with Zoomies? Yes. yes. I love the nods, that's good. Okay, for those of you who don't know, um, we are a chain store, retail and specialty chain store. Uh, we cater to target market um, young teens, maybe 12 to 20, 24. Um, we have currently 750 plus-ish stores. We're about in seven countries. Doesn't seem that big, because I think most locally we feel like, oh, we're in like <coughs> Alderwood, and Bellevue, and Northgate. Northgate was actually our first store back in 1978, so we just celebrated 40 years, which is really exciting. Um, did I say Bellevue or Northgate? Northgate. Yeah, cool, thanks. Okay, <laughs> also can't remember things. Um, so uh, we have um, a private label division, which is where I work. I'm the, I work in the private label department. Yep. Um, so I'm the director of product development, so I manage sort of the, just the process of product between design and production. Um, kind of, we have about, I want to say 20, or private label brands um, that we sell exclusively inside the Zoomies. Uh, if you guys shop there at all, Empire, Dravis, Free World, Zine, all those brands are things that we design and develop in-house. Um, and we have a licensing division too where we work with brands who uh, are, we are up and coming but maybe don't have the infrastructure to support building an apparel brand. So they're able to utilize our sort of process and our structure and our supply chain to build brands so that we can bring them in store. Um, so that being said, uh, we've definitely been talking a lot about just sort of recycling and sustainability and just organic and reusing like fabrics with you know plastic bottles, things like that. But for us it's been really challenging because we are not necessarily totally on the fast fashion end, but we're, we're close. We're in a speed to market calendar, which means we work very close to trend and we try to change our mind at the very last minute to get the right colors, the right silhouettes, all those things out there. Um, so, you know, it, it's hard for us because to come out and be like, you should just go repair it and don't buy anything, that oops, I'd probably get in trouble for that. But at the same time, we want to find a way that is authentic to us. Um, so, you know, when we build brands or do anything for that matter inside of Zoomies. We have everything, um, we do everything through like a, a set of culture values and a set of brand um, values as well. And so when, and I'm gonna tell you culture values strictly because it kind of goes in, in line with all of this. Um, it's empowerment, teaching and learning, recognition, fair and honesty, and fun. And so every time we try to make a decision about something that we're gonna do, we, whether it's bring on a brand, try something new, create a process, create a movement, inspire, do anything, we have to like see it through the culture lens to make sure it's accurate. Because we know we know what our why is, but when it comes to the idea of bringing sustainability and recycling and things like that to our customer, who's 14, they don't necessarily know that why. So we need to find a way to figure out what their why is and speak to that, right? So um, kind of like what Dr. Abbott said earlier, um, most people aren't really thinking about end of life uh, because they just don't, you don't know what you don't know, right? Which is, and I can humbly say that I also, that's kind of why I was here. I wanted to be a part of this is because learning from all of you what you do is fascinating to me. And to, to see the possibilities of what we could do is really great. Um, we have some brands that we've started focus groups around. I think our biggest thing is authenticity, right? We don't want to jump on a bandwagon, but we definitely want to make a difference. Uh, we have a platform, right? We have like 
750 stores and we're across we're cross continental. So how can we use that voice to inspire change? How can we, how can we, we have, it's a young customer, right? And these are like our, they're, they're the future for us. And how do we set a good example that's authentic, that doesn't feel like we're selling out to them? How do we find their why, make it mean something to them so that they not only just buy in, but believe in it, right? And so I think we've definitely tried to, we've been brainstorming for years now about how do we go about doing this in the most authentic way that makes the most sense for, um, for us. Um, we started internally um, by changing just our policies around small things. Um, all the private label is cold wash. We'll never put anything hotter than cold because you can basically achieve the same thing uh, with cold water that you could with hot. And if every single person that buys our stuff washes in cold, how much energy have we saved, right? Um, we try to repurpose. I think, you know, in our development, we have about 50 people in the private label department. There's a ton of development with 20 brands, um, with, you know, we don't have, was it, how many seasons were there that they said earlier? We do not have that many seasons, so <laughs> thank God. Don't tell anybody in my office about that. <laughs> um, we do not have that many seasons, but um, we do have a ton of development for, I think we have maybe six seasons that we, that we work with. And there's a ton of development. There's a ton of denim development. Denim is one of our biggest categories that we carry. Um, we run a lot of fabric through, I mean, just, sadly we run, We've been trying to scale back on rayon because rayon is really it's polluting the way that it's processed, and so we've been trying to scale back on that. Um, we, there's just so much development from a fabric and a denim, uh, denim standpoint that we have decided that at least this has happened for the last four years that we always save all of our scraps, even swatches that get submitted to us for approval, for wash development, for print, whatever. We save all those scraps, and if anybody wants to use them, cool. If not, they would print cycle. Any denim that we have gets pulled aside, that gets saved, and then at the end of every season, we send it to Blue Jeans Go Green. Do you guys know who that is? Um, so it's a, it's a Cotton Works, Cotton Incorporated, and Blue Jeans Go Green are a company that buys, they don't buy back, they, you donate denim to them, um, and they basically turn the denim back into fiber, and then they use that fiber to create insulation, and that insulation is given to Habitat for Humanity to insulate houses. So, and that's something that anybody can do. Anybody can send them down to which it's go where you just throw it in the mail, it's like a mail, it's gone, and, and they'll use it. And it's awesome because that's, again, something else that's not going in the trash, right? So I think our biggest goal is how do we make sure nothing goes in the trash that we can account for. Um, next to that, all of our product, we don't ever, that's always donated, uh, specifically we donate like a tree house and, Friends of youth, foster kids, basically anyone inside of our age range. So any any clothing that we develop, samples, overruns, stuff like that, that all gets donated every year. So that again, we're making sure that it's going back in um, and it's also not going into the trash. Um, so I think doing those things has been really great because we've been able to sort of educate our home office on ways to do things um, so that it, from we can create a change from inside, right? Um, we also have been working on potentially an online portal. Again, going back to the Zoomies culture value of empowerment and teaching and learning, we we want to be able to try to find that bridge where people don't know what they don't know and, and empower them with information. One of the things that we try to do is localize so that people feel like they found their tribe. Kids, to get someone into a store is a big deal, right? I think especially with online nowadays, it's challenging to get people into brick and mortar. So going into those stores, it has to be an experience. And one of the things that we pride ourselves in is having people who connect with our customer and being able to build a, a space that they feel safe in, a space where they found their tribe and they can come to. And so one of the things that we were talking about doing was sort of building awareness through local, just on our website, how do you recycle? How, what do you do at end of life? Putting the URL on our, on our um, care and content labels. Check this out, zoomies.com live, and we have Zoomies TV, our YouTube channel, anything on Instagram, things like that where we can use, again, sort of maximize our platform and our voice to kind of educate everybody and then bring them to a URL that talks about what you can do, where you recycle, how do you donate, how could you upcycle, here's some ideas, here's some links you could go look at. So for us, again, trying to find an authentic way to change the way that they see product, change the way they see what they can do with that, and try to create that awareness and mentality around 
recycling and not sort of just throwing more stuff in the dump, right? Um, what we try to do uh, from a sourcing standpoint, and I'm not in the sourcing department, so I can only speak to this vaguely, but um, we work with a lot of factories who are IRAP certified that was spoken about earlier. Um, our India factories, they take all of the cuttings that come off of production and they recycle all that cotton to create new um, yarns and just do t-shirts, stuff like that. So there's a lot of trying to make zero footprint sort of waste types of things. Um, all of our Mexico factories that work on denim, they have recycling, um, they have water purification systems. And when you wash denim, there's a ton, there's a ton of water that goes into it. So a lot of our factories either do waterless processing or they have a water purification system, which allows them to take all of the water that is now like blue and gray and sudsy and weird, and it goes into this vat and through the process, they're able to come out clean at the other end and then reuse it. And my understanding, I just don't check them, so I was like, I didn't want to misquote you guys. They can reuse anywhere from 50 to 80 percent of the water that they, goes through that system. And anything they can reuse can get, it, it utilizes it for fertilization. So in fact, a lot of the stuff is really like, it's just reusable, which is really great for us because we, that's it's definitely along the lines of what we're trying to achieve. Um, blue sign certification, also we work with a lot of factories that do blue sign certification. That's making sure that your supply chain is um, completely covered in regards to um, reducing your footprint, uh, making sure that you're ecologically aware, like you're not, you're following rules surrounding compliance laws in different countries, right? Every country has a different compliance law, every state has a different compliance law. They're really hard to keep track of. Um, Europe has reach, um, and then the US, we've got a CPSIA, we've got Proposition 65, all these different things that require us to manage um, a restricted substance list that I think our last count was around like 865 chemicals that are restricted for use inside of our production. Um, we, we, we monitor it, we audit, we make sure we do testing to make sure that these things aren't done. And so by utilizing companies that are blue sign certified, we don't have to worry about that as much because we know that they're certified in those things. Ecotech certification is another one. Got certified, which is organic um, in Europe, and we can, and that's simply kind of the same thing as organic um, food, right? You have to pull it away from like the normal process so that it doesn't touch and get contaminated by other things. And so, got certification is similar to that. Um, so I think that for us, like finding ways in to bring in brands that have either sustainable fabrics, got certifications, or bringing awareness to our customers, sort of in the way that we've been trying to find ways to make change um, a little bit at a time, right? Um, we're, we're, we struggle because using recycled products or things where, you know, if you use like Reprieve and you're able to count, okay, well this pan, you save five water bottles from a landfill. And that's super awesome, but like when you pay for Reprieve, which is a company that does that, you can account for those water bottles. Um, that just brings up your fabric cost. I would love to pay for that, but I don't think the 14-year-old kid's mom wants to pay for that necessarily because they might grow out of those pants in six months. And so we, we struggle with ways to, to do that. So through focus groups, we've talked about giving back to parks, giving back to things. Um, and I think that we're really on that path of trying to figure out like what that looks like for us, um, kind of mature at a time. Yeah. Um, so, but we, I think we just we have a platform, we have an audience, and our goal is to just be able to find a way to make authentic change of that. That's it. <laughs> now and I'm, I'm going to hold questions just so we get all of these thoughts up in the air so make sure you write down questions and thoughts and, and we'll get to that part of the discussion uh, I'm Lindsay Lawrence uh, owner designer pretty much every hat uh, for my company uh, we're based here in Seattle Washington we do all of our production locally. We're also a proud member of Seattle Made and Seattle Sewn, which we can see we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, today, I just I really appreciate that everyone's here and having this conversation. I think this is really critical, kind of moving forward. Uh, there's a lot of 
kind of conversation in the world at the moment around how do we decrease our footprint as a global society, but it really, I think it starts at kind of the groundwork, you know, in local economies, and that's where I'm embedded in Seattle as a local manufacturer, and we do all of our production again here in Seattle, but we do sell at about 35 stores across North America and online, and we also have a division where we're also doing co-branded products for corporate gifts and stuff. So uh, my story is uh, I started the company about eight years ago, and my background is in resource management from the University of Washington, and I also have a two-year technical degree in marine carpentry and boat building here in Seattle from uh, the Seattle Central Community College. And uh, I had noticed the huge volumes of not really consumer-based, so it's a little bit different than what we've been talking about, but it's also huge volumes of material, woven material, from the sailing industry, from the sails. And I wanted a bag, and the bags that were being sold were from the East Coast, and they were way out of my price range. So I did a dumpster dive, grabbed an old sail, and made some bags for myself. And people saw them and loved them and asked for more, and then Metamorphic Gear grew out of that. So uh, where we as a company are focused is more kind of pre-consumer or industrial waste streams. Because where I saw the greatest need, but also for a company, as an upcycler specifically, as where we're looking at production, is that we need a consistent material stream from our suppliers. And I really look at them as a supplier. And you have to look at the community that you're embedded in as kind of an ecosystem of companies. Even if they don't see you as a resource or don't know about you yet, you're out there. And you have to in kind of insert yourself into their reality a little bit. And that usually is, in my opinion, uh, after having done this for a number of years, it's the bottom line. You gotta hit, you know, get into the doorway, tell them how much you're gonna save them by, you know, integrating their process with your process, and then there's a whole different listening. Because through talking with the sailing industry or the trucking industry or the fishing industry or the climbing industry, very different ethos around the environmental impact that they have and the positions that the owners will have around that conversation. But they're all going to be very open to the conversation around how can I save you money. Um, our process, as I was saying, we're not a recycler, but I don't think I really need to explain that to this community. We're an upcycler, so we're taking material. We're not adding anything to what it really is. If you haven't had a chance, I've set up a table in the back. You guys can take a look. I would encourage you just so you have an idea of what we're doing. But we're doing uh, mainly accessories, product accessories, where it's uh, like bags, uh, backpacks, computer messenger bag style products, toiletry kits, and dog leashes. Um, all of our products, we have kind of a baseline that we're working off of at 75% or greater recycled products by weight. And then we're also doing uh, all of the products out of the various materials that I was telling you about. And we also have been partnering with a nonprofit organization, so we donate 1%. I really feel that it's really critical to embed yourself in the community that you find yourself in. It actually feeds back on us. Uh, we actually are partnering with uh, Puget Sound Keepers Alliance and have been partnering with them for a couple years now, so we donate product to them. And we actually find that a lot of their uh, members see us as a resource and will actually contact us. And it's a great feedback loop. So we really find that 
the 1%, and I can go into greater detail about this, actually uh, our donation falls within our advertising budget in some way. You know, if you look at the way in which you advertise and communicate to your community, and that can be through donation, is actually feeding back the community that we are working on trying to create. And so it's a really kind of uh, symbiotic relationship. And we also work off of the triple bottom line, so being embedded in the society that we find ourselves, the economy that we find ourselves, and the environment that we find ourselves, all of those three kind of come together to inform us as a company. So um, I wanted to just kind of, our ethos as a company, because we really feel that failure has given rise to the need for upcycling. And so I really hope that all of you fail spectacularly sometime in the next week or so, because the way we think of it is that out of failure, if you think back on the various times in your life, often failure rises and brings us to a different level that actually creates something new that you move into. And those failures we often remember better than the successes. And we're at this time in society that there are a lot of failures out there. And I know we can all talk about failures and we all identify failure very well as humans. It's actually kind of programmed into our psyche and the way we deal with things. It's how we move forward out of identifying the failure in our life. So as a company, we've identified failure, okay? There's a lot of waste out there. Uh, some documentation out there says that 80% of all waste is generated and we never touch it. And it's all industrial waste streams. And so, you know, as a company, that for me is gold, right? That's a failure within the industries that are creating the Subaru's trying to do it where they have a zero waste stream. But the other problem with that is that they've kind of handed that off to their suppliers. And we don't hear often about the suppliers of Subaru dealing with all the waste. Subaru's done very well at diverting that waste off to their suppliers. So now the real problem is now with the suppliers that are supplying Subaru. So as a company, we need to really be looking at those low-hanging fruit as an upcycler, where are we going to get our next round of material? And so it's kind of thinking outside of the box a little bit um, and then reinventing some processes that are not necessarily always that sexy but are actually pretty easy and pretty, if you face it as a problem, it would never be solvable. But then if you talk about it as an opportunity, all of a sudden, things that were necessarily kind of outside of your scope of thought is brought into the forefront and you can actually solve them. Um, and so the changing the failure into opportunity I think is a really critical component of where we find ourselves in our society at the moment and I just would really encourage you guys today to have conversations with people that are outside of your usual group of people that you've already met, already had conversations with, because I really feel like it's out of the conversations that are not typical, not predictable, that real change is manifested. And uh, I would be glad to have further conversations in the back about metamorphic gear also. Thanks. Lindsay, did you have something you wanted to share that you were a fun fact that uh, you didn't get out or are you Yeah, I'm going to be uh, Hobbs for Halloween tomorrow with my younger son, Calvin. <laughs> 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 I hope you come by my house. Yes. Casey, take it away. Hi, I'm Casey. 
Um, I'm a designer, a zoning professional, and the program director for Northwest Zone, formerly known as Seattle Zone. We're undergoing a rebrand right now. I'll cover that more later. So our organization is working to revitalize and diversify the region's zone goods manufacturing sector. So anything that's produced with a sewing machine, that's our niche. Um, and I want to talk today about the inception of the organization, what we've accomplished, and where we're headed. And before I dive in, I just wanted to give a quick thank you to Washington State Recycling Association, Zero Waste Washington and REI for hosting us. Thank you so much. Awesome. This is crazy inspiring. Um, and also to Aaron Nelson of Seattle Good Business Network and uh, Deborah Vandermar with Muses. Um, I'll talk more about their work, but thank you guys for making all this possible. Uh, so first, really quickly, how it started. Northwest Zone began as a partnership between two organizations. You may have heard of them, the first Seattle Good Business Network. Um, their mission is to connect and inspire people to buy, produce, and invest locally so that everyone has a meaningful um, and participatory stake in their local economy. Um, the Seattle Bank program boasts over 500 uh, vendors that are all collected in an incredible database that's accessible to the public. You should definitely check it out at seattlebank.org. Um, so that's the first organization. And then the second is Muses. And uh, full disclosure, I'm also the board chair for Muses. I obviously hooked into this line of work. Um, so Muses' mission is to teach underserved communities how to use industrial sewing equipment. I know everyone's been talking about that today. Uh, feel free to find me after this. Um, so how to use industrial sewing equipment and advocate for their rights so they can to get jobs at local factories or start their own cottage, cottage industries. Um, Muses also runs community development programs uh, focused on textile waste reduction through repair and upcycling. We just got an SPU grant to continue that work, which is awesome. Uh, that's in partnership with Seattle Housing Authority, so we're going to be running every Friday night. There is a like a sewing class every Friday at an SHA property in the Cabrera Court, if you've heard of it, in the SM Terrace. Um, and also monthly events that are pop-up sewing where that are open to the public bring clothes to be repaired, or um, they can learn a little bit more about how to use a sewing machine. So very inclusive and very educational. Um, so at the time of Northwest Zone's inception, um, Seattle Good Business Network, Aaron was getting a lot of inquiries from potential um, participants and producers for Seattle, uh, for Seattle Made, who were like, I want to make a sewing product, but I can't find anyone to sew anything. And then you have Muses, on the other hand, who's like, we're training a ton of people and they all need jobs. So this really just seemed like a good opportunity. We put our heads together and um, we secured some grant funding through the Duwamish, Duwamish River Opportunities Fund to dig deeper in 2017. So through that body of work, that's where I want to jump into the accomplishments. This is all the stuff that we did in 2017 that um, was really phenomenal. And it's funny because when I was putting all this data together, I was like, we did do all of that. <laughs> wow, that time flew. Um, so with that money, we expanded the training frequency and depth um, that Muses was performing. We connected sewers to local brands, and we had some really big wins there. Actually, Lindsay was one of our participants, which was awesome. Um, we performed a case study through the UW's Evans School to evaluate uh, what comprises a, sex a successful sum trade. Um, we collected tons of data about the Sun Goods ecosystem through workshops. One of those was hosted by REI, again, thank you. Um, focus groups, online surveys, and then we created an online platform for resource sharing among industry players. And some of you who are in the industry may know this, but one of the biggest barriers to success as a small independent designer is the access to resources. It is, even if it's the outdoor industry, whatever it is, it's very, siloed and there's a lot of scarcity mentality around resources and who your supplier is and who your sellers are. Um, so we're just trying to kind of break up some of that and get people to open the door a little bit because if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander, right? Okay, so um, that was a ton of work and as you can imagine, there were a lot of key lessons that we took away from all of that and that's kind of where I want to step into where we're going with this organization. Um, so there's a lot of overlap and compounding between the things I'm going to look at. I'm going to give you the top five. Um, and there's a lot of overlapping and compounding, as you can imagine. But um, the first thing that we encountered that was really problematic is a lot of people who were 
new to the industry and who were in independent designers who wanted to make a product had some really phenomenal ideas, but they did not have a ton of manufacturing experience. Um, and that's hard, that's just, that's difficult for them to achieve success. And it also unintentionally leads some of them to unethical business practices about how they interact with labor, um, sourcing materials. Um, so to that end, our answer to, to that problem is to launch a product development workshop uh, to educate entrepreneurs about how products come to market, make sure they're prepared when they engage with vendors, um, help shape their expectations around ethical labor, sustainable manufacturing, sound economic practices, um, and just how do you use your product to educate consumers? And I feel like that keeps coming up today. It's like, how do we change the consumer mentality? And there have been some really great ideas here today that I'm excited to go and simmer over as I do. Um, but it is really incumbent on brands to do the most that they can to educate their client about how the product is made. And a lot of people are really doing incredible stuff, but they don't always think to share. They're so focused on selling this product that they don't think about like, oh, maybe somebody wants a little insert of like, this is the person who sewed this bag. And obviously, lately, there's a lot more um, interest in telling those types of stories, so we're hoping to just keep that trajectory. Um, uh, the other issue we, we faced was that manufacturers, um, even if they're producing on a smaller scale, need production consistency using a diverse array of industrial equipment, which is not super great for people who are sewing at home. It takes up a lot of room. There's no guarantee that you have the right machine to produce finished X, Y, Z. Um, and it's, it's a very complicated recipe to, um, to get the two to match up. So this led us to evaluate the viability of a small run production studio or a co-op model studio space that could serve fledgling brands that need product or are unable to meet high minimum order quantities um, that are demanded by most of the existing local facilities. A lot of the cut so operations, it's like, you want to produce with us? We're not even going to talk to you until you're ordering a thousand. And people are like, I need 20. <laughs> so um, how do, we're, we're just working to kind of bridge that gap. Um, the other thing, as you've all heard, the demand for sewing services is very high, and this kind of, again, compounds on the last thing I just mentioned, but the conditions to meet them are highly variable for both for sewers and for manufacturers. So for this reason, um, Muses, the training organization, has um, is working with a larger organization, organization called the Makers Coalition, which has a federally recognized training curriculum for sewers, which is awesome news because the route that Muses is going is instead of training independent sewers, is to lean on existing infrastructure to create an apprenticeship program where people have, um, their, where workers and, um, and students are paid a fair wage, guaranteed, they're able to benchmark their process, or their progress, uh, and they learn specialized skills through vetted employers offering safe environments. And when they gain autonomy through those programs, then they can come out as a skilled sewer who has more autonomy, more agency to like synthesize instead of um, you know just working on the line and being, you know doing exactly what they're told to do. Um, which is not to discredit people doing that work because it's necessary and it's awesome and it's a skill set all its own. And then there are some people who are like, I'm bored with that, give me the next thing. So we really want to be fostering people who are looking to seek uh, more, more skill and specialized work. Um, the, the last two things I'm going to mention really quickly. Uh, the platform that we launched works. It's great. People are sharing resources. Uh, right now it's a closed forum for those who are already working in the industry and we're currently working on expanding the platform to um, include a public facing database similar to Seattle Maids, uh, but specifically for the sewn goods trade. Um, kind of similar to a maker's row, but um, just more hyper localized with a lot more vetting about what specialties a factory can produce because we found that there are a lot of people out there who are like, we do it all, we do swimsuits, we do soups. And it's like, mm, you do one, one or two things well and you take the rest. So how do we weed those with those out and really get to the core of what people are doing well so we can really bump up their services and sell them uh, you know, across the ecosystem that we're trying to create. Um, the last bit is that our industry does not have a unified voice to lobby uh, government to incentivize sustainable sewn goods manufacturing, and that is 
critical. There's a lot of low hanging fruit here. We had a focus group. I'm just going to share this anecdote. This is not my notes, but I have to share this share with everyone I talk to. We had a focus group where a brand flat out told us when we were like, well, when you when you have your textile come into the port of Seattle, and they were like, stop there. They're like, we don't ship anything in the port of Seattle. They're like, it's too expensive. We ship everything into California, and we truck it up, and it's still less expensive. And we're like. Okay, so there's the carbon footprint thing, right? <laughs> but also, like, let's talk to the board. There has to be some way to lower some of the costs that are associated. Um, there are tons of government programs out there. How do we tap into those? And that's really where um, the next step that we've taken comes in, and that we're recognizing the need. Um, and that has led us to begin assembling a diverse advisory board that includes brands, CUSO facility, uh, facilities, labor constituents, product developers, textile vendors. So we're all pulling together to foster um, sustainable infrastructure that supports us all. Um, and we're also looking at a kind of developing a social enterprise. Like, is there a way for us to create uh, products that are made by our, our vendor business or our member businesses so that we can literally build our values into physical products that we sell to hopefully gain revenue for for the uh, for the organization. Um, and the last bit, of course, is that little rebranding thing. So we, after we had named it Seattle Stone initially, we're like, you know, after we got all this feedback from the members, people were like, why is it just Seattle? There's so many people producing just outside. How do we make it a little more? We, we still want that local feeling. How do we open the doors up to um, to a bigger network of people? So you know, we're trying to just focus on the Northwest in general. Um, so uh, Washington, Idaho, Oregon, and even up north to Canada and BC. So um, that's my time. Hopefully, I didn't run over too far. I know that's a lot of data. Please feel free to come find me afterward. And thank you again for your time and consideration. Fun fact, oh gosh, um, is some of my Andy work has been featured on a little television show called RuPaul's Drag Race. Great, thanks so much. Uh, that's an excellent one. Ruth, fun fact, and look forward to hearing your thoughts. All right, fun fact, or just not so fun fact. I just need to get up for a minute. Uh, fun fact, uh, I've got terrible ADD and I just got in last night from visiting family for three weeks in Europe. So sitting is hard for me. Um, also, I am a recovering mindless consumer. I used to buy whatever I wanted, whatever I could afford, and whatever I needed without thinking about it. Um, I'm also, uh, uh, I'm not gonna divulge too much, but I'm also, I appear to be a raging hypocrite because um, if I offend any large brands, forgive me, uh, but I did also author the 12 Steps of Amazon Anonymous. And um, along with that, at this point, I also might need to use Amazon to stay in business. So the hypocrisy runs deep, and I still haven't figured any of it out. But I'm going to bring you along the journey of trying to figure it out um, as quickly and efficiently as I possibly can. Um, I used this image uh, to put up there. Um, because it's just where we are right now. I'm just in a pile of scrap, in a pile of garbage, trying to figure this stuff out. Um, I developed this company called Newbie 9 through my business that I had a retail store for eight years, uh, which was US made and sourced, an element of, of retail goods um, and made on a relatively local level, hoping nothing really had to fly over oceans, and um, I'm a food localist, so, Try doing that for eight years, it's rough, it's rough. People, the buy-in to buying things um, locally made is still not there because we are getting messages, I don't know from who, but we are getting messages that we want things faster, cheaper, and now. And that's just not good for, I think, um, what's going on in the world. Um, I'm gonna give you a short story um, because everything's about the story for me. I got in last night, but I was visiting my daughter in uh, Sevilla, Spain. She's studying abroad. Um, she's studying uh, environmental um, analysis, but I did not give her the Kool-Aid. I don't know where she, you know, how, how this happened, but 
Anyway, um, and we went to a little town, Rhonda, um, and I, I just tagged along um, at our field trip, and we went to this little town, and it was stunning. It was like one of the highlights of, of our trip. Um, three days later, bridges that have been in this little town for multi, for, for centuries and centuries, were being washed away by floods. And I'm like, really? And then I sit here and go, you know, this group is so great, but I want, I want a megaphone out every single window. And I want to know how we as people that are working so hard to do a good job to solve some of these major issues, and how we get it out, how we're not always preaching to the choir. Um, so that's, you know, if you want to talk about that, I don't know. I, I might need a sedative, but um, <laughs> anyway. Um, but it's, it's, it's huge passion. So back to my daughter. Um, everything's always back to the children. By the way, um, since you're a doula, my other daughter's almost in labor, so David, if I need your assistance. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, anyway, the um, newbie nine, what came out of my daughter, uh, I had to take her basketball team independent um, because it was girls basketball and the boys got all the attention and all the good coaches and the girls got daily. Um, so I all of a sudden was managing a basketball team and couldn't find U.S. made and sourced uniforms because that had become a value of mine. Um, so I decided to make them because I'm a problem solver. If you can't find something, make it. Um, so I was also learning through Newbie Green about recycled poly, and I thought, okay, wouldn't this be nice if we can also teach youth athletes that consume a lot of one-time use plastic um, that their uniform is out of their plastic bottle and maybe they can become more aware and use less one-time use plastic. So that's a fantasy, and um, it became a little bit of a reality, and we did this, but um, we recently had to put that section of the business on hold because we can't compete with the Nikes and the Adidas, and, and when you were talking about just getting a little bit of reprieve, we're using all reprieve. So, you know, it's doing business and trying to do something that is good for the world and makes a little bit of margin is tough, and I know you all know that. So um, we are still working on our uh, streetwear line and athletic wear and everything else. Um, but here's here's the problem. When, when I started this business, and I was learning about recycled poly, and I was sort of interviewing various people that make fiber out of recycled plastic. Um, this one salesman um, said, yeah, well, and we have a take back program when you get big enough and we can take back everything up to 14% spandex. So I'm like, great. So that was sort of our border for the fabrics we were developing. And we always wanted to use mostly recycled, but we needed some um, uh, movement. Anyway, fast forward, we got, you know, the, this storage unit is bigger than it appears there, but we got enough to send back. And they said, well, we can't really take back anything with any spandex in it. We, we haven't really um, got that up to uh, an efficient um, use, you know, to their standards and their returns on investment. And they essentially said, no, we, we can only take 100% recycled poly back. Well, whoops, I believed them. I'm not done trying to figure this out, but this is where I am in my business, where we have all the scrap we save and we have um, unused uniforms and, and a lot of samples and trying to build this business, and we're still trying to figure it out. So that said, the circularity of what we're doing is still critical, and I, so, so let me just end with one other um, story of what I was talking to someone even today about, and, and it was in listening to a, a lot of this textile, um, and, and how we send it globally to countries in need. And that's admirable and that's great. But, but just think of this fantasy that I'm still working on. What if um, Haiti, poor country, island, has a ton of plastic, huge problems. They can't afford to ship their plastic off the island. Um, what if we could send a small, like, microbrewery 
uh, container, uh, not shipping container, that was my last life. But what if we could send a business to Haiti where they could take their plastic and, and chip it and put it into pellets, extrude the fiber, make fabric, create an outfit, uniform, what have you, and then recycle it again. And what if we give them or help them either be educated or create uh, circular economies that can spread all over? To me, that would be really awesome. And I'm, I'm sorry everybody's not here because they also are doing the um, cellulose fiber uh, recycling, um, where upcycling is critical. Everything everybody in here is doing is critical. But um, to me, it's that is um, a future science conundrum. I do believe that the technology is out there because I do believe that the guy from Reprieve that told me that they could, that they can, but we're still in a closed, um, we're, we're still not open sourcing um, a lot of the information, so I'm still not sure how to get it. Meanwhile, um, back at the ranch, I'm gonna try and figure out how to make some furniture out of some of our scraps because storage gets expensive. The other thing that I'm working on really quick, and what those questions are, is a book that I'm writing called Mindful Consuming. Because at the end of the day, really, we as a people and, and as a consuming body need to make better decisions. And we can, we can regulate, we can upcycle, we can do everything we can, but at the end of the day, we have to be careful as consumers. So eventually I'll get done with this book. But if you ask yourself one, two, or three of those questions before you buy anything, we're off to a, a good start. Each one of those will end up being a chapter or so in a book, I think, at some point, when I'm not <laughs> delirious. Um, so thank you for listening to me. And Heather, thank you again for um, letting me come do this, knowing I was going to be a little um, delirious. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, actually going to be on me, but uh, again, I got paid like a teacher, so I wanted to make sure like, you know, a lot of that work was kind of delegated to the kids so that they could learn how to really sort of manage this process, right? Um, so going back to that, within teaching, like, I just had this really great conversation with kids, and it was really about like, how can we impact our communities? What is something that you can make that wasn't just for yourself, but what is something that you can make and do and create? that was about something else outside of yourself. So again, we were able to sort of look at engineering from a scalable perspective, where it was like, I want to make this little thing that can impact the whole world, or I want to make this big thing that can just impact like my neighborhood. So we had a lot of great fun having those kind of projects and sort of diving into um, engineering that way. And now that I'm sort of like full-time designer and I kind of like teach on the side, um, I still take a lot of that philosophy of like designing with the intent of community um, with the work that I do. Um, so, Eficio started when I came here um, trying to sort of look at the whole makerspace situation. And what I really found out was that like, when people thought of these spaces, usually you left with a product that looked like you made it. It looked like a place that was only for prototyping, and for me, I wanted to show that these spaces, you can actually come out with like shelf-ready products. There were things that people would spend good money on, and also they were just like out of quality that just, you know, you wanted to spend some good money on, right? Like that's kind of like where we want to be as local designers. Um, but then I started off with just using sofa scraps. So um, there was a company that just had like a sample of leather and like this one big ring, and I was like, I'm going to make some things out of this leather because the leather looked luxurious, and I just want to laser cut onto it and make these clutch bags or make this wallet. And I just wanted a quick sample of like what a, a company could look like coming out of a makerspace. Um, and so that's what started Eficio, and it's really just to show people that you can have quality products um, from just whatever found material, um, and they can look nice. And so it started off with just the wallets, um, clutch bags, then it kind of got into this backpack that I made um, that ended up having a lot of people just ask, kind of like where Lindsay was, where it was just like, oh, I, I want another version of that, or I want you to do that with this scale, and it just became this word of mouth um, way of producing that was really manageable for me because at the time I was still kind of teaching. Um, so I was like, I only have so many hours in a day to have the energy to do anything. And so I was like, just low level stuff. Um, and it became really fun. Um, so I wanted to do this uh, really full time and I started sort of making enough uh, profit that I could just sort of branch off and do that full time, which now I do. Um, but I wanted to sort of grow in a way that allowed me to still be playful and experimental. So I have two studios right now, one is in Soto, and that's where I have more of like a fashion um, sort of experimental space, where I have a designer there that's uh, upcycling jean for jewelry. I have another woodblock person there that's where we're collaborating and doing custom um, prints and custom fabrics. Um, and then that's also a space where I just collect a bunch of random things. Like there was a, a school that was built, um, it was like a community center that was built that hosts educational workshops that they had all this um, fire hose left over. I had no clue what I wanted to do with the fire hose, but I knew they were going to throw it away. And I've seen businesses start off of just doing like fire hose bags and everything like that. And that was great, but I wasn't inspired to do those products, but I still have this pile of you know, fire hose there that um, at one point it was actually my packaging, but then it was just too laborious to cut it all up and it's just still there. But I'm dedicated to still having that space be experimental in that way. Um, and I'll show you where that's going in like two more slides after this. Uh, but then going back to um, the community, I started doing more uh, fashion shows and sort of more things that were aligned with things that I cared about. Um, so that kind of kick-started me actually getting into full-on fashion. This is clips from two fashion shows. One that was actually right at the waterfront that was um, sponsored and supported by the Friends of the Waterfront of Seattle. Um, and that was a fashion show called Ancestral Future where I looked at how can we take um, you know, digital prototyping, like using 3D printing, laser cutting, but how can we also focus on narratives of our communities? So I looked at the um, Filipino, Taino, which is where I'm from, Puerto Rico, and that's uh, the indigenous people there, um, and then the Macaw tribe of the Pacific Northwest. And what I wanted to do was look at the, t the patterns, symbols, and textiles of those, of those cultures, and how can we sort of reinvigorate that, and retell those stories um, just in an innovative way, and have another platform of art that can you know, create conversation around what's happening within those groups and in those tribes. Um, so Ancestral Future came out of that, um, and then my, my last fashion show was at the Seattle Art Museum that focused specifically on the Macaw tribe. 
Um, and there I was able to sort of wrangle in um, people from the Macaw tribe that were the models, some of them were the designers that I helped uh, that worked with me to make sure that I was sort of deconstructing and sort of using their work appropriately um, that wasn't disrespectful to them. Um, and then also this picture is the Queen Macaw, um, who now they sort of like every year there's a new queen. Um, so anyway, so it was really great to sort of be a part of like these communities and actually like bring technology and innovation to them, but also like with this conscious aspect of the things that I'm making always came from just like leftover materials. And I was always sort of going to friends, people who had some sort of jacket that they didn't want that I would just, you know, sort of tear off the sleeve and make a purse out of, or like, it just kind of started like that and still going in that direction. Um, but recently, um, I just received a grant from Four Culture that allowed me to go back into the research that I was kind of doing at the college level before I left the Barcelona. So over there, my research focused on, you know, how can we 3D print at the building scale? So I was designing these tools that would be attached to, you know, these like crazy huge six-axis robots. And the idea was like kind of this like material science experimentation of how can we look at, you know, sustainable materials when we're looking at new manufacturing machines. And so because the machines were now being sort of more accessible, we were looking at more new materials that would be implemented within those machines. So a lot of the research that happened there was looking at upcycling sort of like hemp fibers to act as, like there was like this hemp fiber spray that a colleague of mine had designed that just had this like uh, mannequin that it would spray onto and then it would sort of dry up and actually made a garment from that. Um, but the work that they're doing right now kind of inspired the work that I'm kind of getting into, which is just around biofabrics and bioplastics. Um, one of them uses, this one in the corner is kombucha that's um, sort of mixed with um, other secret ingredients um, to sort of solidify it. That's a, that, that it's like kind of like, the kombucha one is okay, it's like a little stiff, but it almost gives you like, uh, I don't know, more of like a plasticky feel. Whereas right now, because I worked a lot in leather, because leather became that material that just like, for some reason is always like high quality, like all the leather shoes or the leather bag or the leather whatever. Uh, just has that elevated quality to it that I wanted to find a new sort of material that if I was done with this bag, I could throw it in the compost and be done with it. And so mushroom is one that I'm actually working on right now. Um, and that's the bottom one that's on the corner. And just the quality of that texture, again, gives you quality. So for me, when I enter this sort of conversation of upcycling, I'm always like, I, we want it to be upcycled, but the reality of our consumers is that they don't want it to look upcycled. So how do you do that? There's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, and for me, I'm kind of going down the nerdy science route of sustainable material. Um, that's me. Take climbing rope from Lindsay and have double Dutch lessons. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just if you're up for staying a little longer. Um, Sue, fun fact, and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Okay. Let's see. Um, well, one thing I don't have a presentation. You heard most of what I have to say, um, but I'll make a couple of comments. Um, the fun fact, sorry. Sorry, this is a little consumery, but I guess my fun fact is that since coming to REI, I am kind of working for free because all my money goes back to REI. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I will repurpose it and recycle it when, when I'm done. Um, the, the only thing I wanted to say at the end of this is this is really exciting to be a part of this and, and hear all the ideas and the inspiration. Um, because I think that what we're facing here in recycling in general and in dealing with waste, a lot of it is an information problem and it's just about getting the connections made and getting the uh, information about who has what and, and getting it to the right person who can use it. Uh, in, our, in our system of garage sale, etc., that, that's our challenge. Um, the, the items come back. I think a number of people have mentioned that it is a big management challenge. Everything is now in each. There's no longer any of that good information that we had as uh, retailers about the, the items to kind of get them directed to their new life. So I, I look at all this as an information problem and I look forward to this discussion giving me and everyone else some ideas about how to solve some of these issues. So thanks. I know I'm filled with a million uh, threads 
minutes of conversation to have and, uh, <laughs> questions, but I'm going to open it up first and see if uh, we can launch from all of you. Any immediate questions? Uh, oh, I'll bring it back. Okay, great. I feel like the big elephant in the room is the amount of stuff that we have. How, how do we continue an economy and a creative brain without just making more and more and more stuff? I mean, you go out to our yard, it would take years for this region to buy all the stuff in the store. And we don't need our houses filled with it. We have this minimalist, um, you know, Conferees that people are trying to get things out of their house, not get more, but we keep buying more. And Amazon, and we keep buying more and having it shipped directly to us to our houses. How do we back off on that and realize we can survive with less and still keep the economy going and still create good jobs and still, you know, be the humans with individualism that we are? That's a big question. I know that's an idea. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's a great question, and I think you know, coming from a, a company and a brand that is still making brand new clothing and selling that in a very large scale, um, it's something that we we talk about every single day, and it's in our space and it's in our meetings and it's in our room all the time. Um, and I think, you know, obviously we are the recycling sector of that company and my answer is don't buy anything new. There's already plenty of already made goods out there and we've kind of lost our connection to each other when we stop sharing the things that aren't out in the cycle of use. And we leave them in our closets or throw them away. We don't choose to continue their life. Um, or repair what's already in existence, or when you're thinking about making new things, think wisely about your materials. I think like the, the mushroom leather, I've heard some really amazing things about that, and it's cool to see it, and just sort of starting to think differently about how we move forward. If we are, we're always going to live in this culture of wanting newness and feeling that kind of sense of hollowness and need, you know, need but how, how many of us in this room actually need anything at this point? Probably very few people could make it through the day with what you already have. So when you think about that, it's kind of like, you know, what level of involvement in your purchasing decision are you going to make? And if you are thinking first, I think you buy something that's already been made, and then you think about, okay, a responsible decision if it's a brand new product. Or is it blue sign certified? Is it organic cop? Who's making it? Where it's being made? And then, and then what are the systems for it down the road? So is it designed for Durability is it designed for take back? Is it designed for reuse? Um, but I think I mean I think it's it's a great question and it's a hard one to answer as a business because uh, it's radically changing the way that we think about our fabulous capitalist society. Ruth, do you have a comment or? It's the question that keeps me up every night, I, truly, and and it, because if we all don't consume, there's there's a whole job and money issue. Um, what happens, you know, as I dis big brands, well, wait a minute, they're also employing and creating, so these are, these are really tough issues. Um, and um, a really good friend of mine, before I wrote the book, he hated the oxymoron of mindful consuming, to which I respond, we're not going to slow down our consuming until we're at least mindful about it. So if we start being mindful about our consumption patterns, we will slowly evolve into consuming things that are better for our environment and our, ourselves, I think, I hope. I think um, there's a book that I keep going back to. It was written by William McDonough, Cradle to Cradle. And there's conversations that I've seen today about the biological world and the kind of industrial world and you know the consumption aspect of our society and how we generate wealth is a huge rabbit hole and how we have that conversation but we really I think and we're touching on it 
in various ways about there are aspects of all the materials that we use on a daily basis from the vehicles we use, if it's a bike or a car, or if we've flown recently, or the materials we use on a daily basis from our clothing to our shoes. How do we separate that material out so that we are designing more intelligently? I would love to not be using the materials I use because they are inherently toxic to the communities in the world, but our design of our products is to try to keep them at least one generation out of the waste stream, which to me is terrible. I don't want to even be thinking that, yes, all the material is going to end up in the landfill, but that's the reality that we live in now. And so one of the things that we're working with, like Ferrari over in Europe, not in the US, but in Europe, there's a manufacturer called Freitag, and they make bags out of very similar material. And in Europe, they have a material recycling process that can utilize the material I use. But the US, it doesn't have that, it doesn't exist. And so I can't access that to have another avenue as a resource recycling process yet. And you know, I'm not going to go out and invent that in the marketplace. So there are these kind of low-lying aspects of, you know, recycling and repurposing where it can be brought back into the marketplace as an absolutely virgin material that has all the, you know, imbued aspects that are being required and asked for within these different industries. And I think until we can kind of start figuring out those circles of keeping things very separated from what we're seeing in the problem around plastic pollution in the oceans. Why is that a problem going forward? You know, a lot of com countries are seeing that, you know, plastic is a resource. We can actually utilize that and not have it just be a, a problem out in the environment. And until we can figure that, I think that we're going to be continuing to see this as a recurring issue. Can I ask that question? Because I'm not just so curious. Do you know if there's other countries where there's more successful um, recycling, repurposing, there's been a large public investment in, in subsidizing those business models, or are those business models that seem to be able to stand alone? They're definitely not standing alone. Uh, so like the investment that Ferrari got uh, they're based out of Milan, Italy, and uh, it's different than the car manufacturer, I'll just put that out, but the Ferrari, uh, they had, I think, an initial 10-year tax incentive break on the company itself when they presented it to the uh, company. I, I can't remember exactly, I did a paper on them, but uh, now we're kind of dredging some old information out of my brain, but the initial uh, kind of beginning of that company was the partnership with Frytalk because they had all of this material stream that they were able to access that they had already gone in and uh, figured out how to bring all that material to their manufacturing in Switzerland. And just across the border in Italy, they were looking at how to recycle this material also, so they created a partnership. And then the local economy in that area said, we'll give you a tax incentive to create that manufacturing or that recycling capability in our area. So there were a number of levels that that actually was taken on. And it wasn't just, oh, we'll you know, look at making money here for this recycling. There were a number of layers that actually had that be successful. And just to add to that, one of the other pieces of public support is the regulatory structure that local and federal governments provide. So in Europe, there's a lot more manufacturer and producer responsibility where the manufacturers have to take products back. And if you, as a manufacturer, have to take your product back, you're probably going to design it to be more recyclable, less toxic, more disassemblable because it's your bottom line all of a sudden now that um, is being impacted. So all of a sudden you see design changes and you see things like BMW switched to another car who once they had to take their vehicles back, 
uh, switched from 40-some plastic resins down to less than a dozen in each car so that they'd be more identifiable and disassemblable and recyclable. So there's that type of government support as well that we see less of here. Uh, other questions, Heather? Um, so that was a very inspirational panel. Um, and my question is another top one, and I, I think officially for um, Casey and Gabriel, but the others of you might have comments. So we live in a very expensive region, and the, what I'm wondering is how can you make it work in terms of being able to pay wages, pay living wages, and then a product that is not expensive that people can't afford to buy. So this is sort of part of that bigger question of how do we make green and sustainability something that is not some expensive thing, um, et cetera. I'm sorry. I um, I think it comes back to the point about regulation and lobbying efforts. Um, there definitely has to be some sort of subsidy at the outset in order for the whole thing to catch fire and really get public support. And again, we just keep talking about consumer mentality and like how do you change it. And I feel like um, one thing that the apparel industry has done very well is um, weaponizing exclusivity. Um, and what I would love to do is see how how it can be weaponized for the, the cause of social change. <laughs> like, how can we subvert that whole thing? Um, and I don't have answers, sorry. Um, I'm not the guy with the answers today, I guess. But um, I do feel like the subsidy is a great place to start. Um, make it cool, make uh, local government want to buy in, and that, that is a really good start. And, there, and look how many people are here doing fantastic work on the ground. There's so much change and agents for change in this room alone. And it's like, if you had that extra boost, what can you do? I know everyone's thinking about it already. So <laughs> um, how do we lobby? You know, that's the question. Um, um, for, well, that's a lot. Um, for me, it's just me by myself. I don't have employees. I don't have anyone else that is making anything for me. It's me with my laser cutter and my sewing machine and all the hours of the day that I feel like working. Um, the, the thing that makes it work is the fact that like I'm not out here trying to mass produce or duplicate anything. All the work that I do, all the products that I make are custom products. There are for one-on-one -on -one individuals or a company that needs a set of aprons. And I'm not gonna work with that company again because I made them the apron that's gonna last them a long time. And I focus on quality, and in that case, yeah, my things are a little bit more expensive than most, but you're getting a quality product that's going to last a lot longer, one. And then two, like how I'm sort of impacting community goes back to my work as an educator. I grab my money from you know selling things at a certain price, and then I go back and I'm able to teach at local museums and community centers and things like that to lend my expertise to the next generation so they can have those skills so that they can then sort of take it into whatever direction they want to. Um, but for me, the work that I do pays my bills enough that I can live in Pioneer Square. Like, that's, that's good enough for me. I'll just add that I think that story is a huge aspect now around consumer behavior. Uh, if you can present a good story about what you're up to and people can latch on to that, I think that you have the ability to reach out to those different communities really easily. Uh, you know, the ability to say that we're made in the USA or Northwest built. I mean, partnering with Seattle Made, all of those avenues of being able to talk about what you're up to as a brand. Um, you know, and we're a little bit different in the sense of that I am focused on trying to make something that is repeatable over and over and over again because we do co branding with large. Uh, industry like Microsoft, we've done a lot of co-branded bags with them for events and shows. And so we're trying to show that we can actually be quick to the market when they need something that is actually competing against the product that would be brought in from China. And to be able to do that, we've got to be very nimble and quick and be able to present why we would be a viable alternative. It may not be a huge bag, but it is a product that actually has some viability, some interest, and actually presents their brand well. And so really having both sides of those and really kind of being aware of 
what they're looking for and what we need to be able to be a viable company. Question? Yeah, I'm just curious. Um, I love what Casey said about you know making it cool, and I think that when you think about making it cool, it just kind of brings this youthful mindset into the picture, which I feel really you know goes to children and what we're teaching them. And I'm wondering, you know, the overarching thing that I'm hearing is less is more. And how are we or any of you connecting to the schools to kind of share that message and try to make it cool at a young age for kids to start focusing and changing how they think about consuming things? to really connect on this level in schools perhaps but I know that through our store team um, we've been working on educating them to because we've tried to create a environment by which I mean, we have a lot of we have a lot of cons uh, um, customers that come in their kids that have worked for their allowance money and they come in to buy something cool right and that's who a lot of our customer is to be honest and um, they don't, like to them, Made in America isn't like, they want it, you know, they want something they can afford and something cool. And that's a challenge for us because obviously we have priorities for certain things like sustainability and changing our carbon footprint and all these other things as a company, but yet we have this customer who, who comes in at nine or 10 years old and wants to purchase something with the $5 they earned from breaking the leaves. So it's, it's a challenge and I think for us, we've been trying to, sort out how, again, through, in an authentic way, can we find a why that speaks to that age group and um, so that they buy into it. Not, it's not even a buy-in, like they feel that. We want them to feel why it's important. Um, and that's what we're trying to be very careful about. So obviously, if anybody has any suggestions, I would love to hear them. Um, but we want to find that um, authentic why for them so that we can, through our store team then, teach and educate everyone on what that looks like, how they can make a difference, and then through the store team then work with the, with the consumers on here are some things you know, that you could do or go check out our website because this is, again, like you said, we want to make it cool. That's how it's going to work for us. That's how we're going to get buy-in. Partner with brands because earlier in the presentation, the Seattle presentation, it's about that kid who follows that brand and then inertia will guide them in a direction, right? And that's totally true. They're, they're going to be loyal to that brand, or they're going to be loyal to what that stands for, because that's what helps them fit in. So creating the cool, educating through the store team, I think for us is kind of our MO and how we're going to try to approach it. Um, I just hope it works, really. And I, oh, sorry. And I try and teach all my kids that Goodwill is really cool. <laughs> um, just from like the super technical perspective of Seattle and federal way school systems, because I, I was a legit public school teacher, um, I got into teaching not because I went to school for teaching. Um, I went through a program called CTE, which is Career Technical Education. I'm only pitching that because that is an opportunity for like, honestly, anyone in this room, any industry, any company, that is your gateway into getting into the classroom. They are really focused, especially right now, there's a lot of money going to like STEM education at industry standard, and what's missing is the collaboration of industry going into the classroom. People think it's this big gate, this big wall to get into the classroom to reach kids, and it's really not. Every, uh, every elective, every one of these like programs are like at the door, like scratching for this sort of like experience of industry coming into the classroom. And the problem is that the teacher is too tired to do the footwork to do that, right? So like they have to be the ones that actually initiate and make those collaborations and make those connections, which is extremely exhausting. I was grateful because I was coming in from industry, so I already had those connections. So I would do things like a bigger symposium, invite demos and people to come in and show the process of the work that they're doing. But I feel like just, you know, the, the best thing that we can do when we're talking about public school education is encourage anyone who has any sort of connection to any business to actually just go to any school that they want to and say, what are the opportunities? Because I doubt that any school will say, I'm sorry, no, we're at capacity of industry coming in and inspiring our kids. <laughs> <laughs> Casey? Yeah. 
So I talk about this all the time with muses, is glamorizing manufacturing jobs again. It is the goose that lays the golden egg. And yet, time after time, I will go into a factory or production floor, and I'll hear people say, well, if you just want to sew, and it's always that word that just kills me. It's like, you need that person with their butt in seat sewing to get your product. Why is there not more value? And if we, through Muses, we, we want to uh, launch an apprenticeship program, we talk about all the time going into high school and getting a really track. And I know that's kind of later than the original question I posited for, you know, like, um, in terms of where kids are at in post-secondary education. But that is a way to make it cool. It's like, hey, I have this really cool factory job where I'm learning how to make stuff. And it's, it's no longer just a dead-end job where you're sitting in a sewing machine. It's like, it's a career track. We've lost that with offshoring, and I'm not um, I'm not necessarily like a jingoist, or I'm like, we have to bring everything back on shore. Like, I understand it's a complex network, but there is something to be said for even teaching kids like how stuff is made is a huge, important thing. So um, uh, again, I'm just gonna beat the apprenticeship drum again and again and again. As many opportunities I have during this panel. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I want to drill down on is this, this notion of not only scalability, but also, um, well, one of the things we've heard a lot about is what you were just speaking of. How do we get more sewers, sewers, sew techs? What tools do you see? How do you find the people that are filling those roles in each of your organizations? I realize it's a slightly different role in each one, but how do we get more people trained, skilled in the pipeline? And what roles can local governments play, other industries play? Well, I'm holding this, so I'll talk. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think that's a great question. I think we also need to make sure that they're making responsible products. And I think that needs to go hand in hand, that we're not just talking about making more and more and more and more manufacturing locally. It's thinking about end of life and end of use for the products as well, and then the original materials and where that's coming. For us, we are our material source in our manufacturing organization, so that's really interesting. We kind of cut a whole portion out of manufacturing there. When you're thinking about making new goods, we've already got the materials. But in that space, we've added sorting and deconstruction. So we've had to basically train our whole team some, as an entirely new skill set on how to assess a component and then sort it into a particular area and then deconstruct it for manufacturing. Um, and that's literally in our team learning how to do that and then training up a team of six sewers currently. Um, and yeah. Please. Yeah. Oh, yeah, let's. Do you have the. Or here, I'll burn it down. <laughs> it's off. Oh, it's off. Oh. Um, that we are asking to come in and do the work 
work for us? Are we respecting what their needs are? Do we even know what their needs are? Or do we just put a placard on the wall and say, we need these people, and then sit there and go, oh, boo hoo, nobody's coming? Or are we going into the communities where people are looking for work, finding out what they need, and then changing our attitude so that they truly become partners, so they truly are honored? Again, I'm gonna, Lindsay has done this fantastically with, with one sower. But it has taken several years now to really develop a relationship with someone because he really got to know her and she really got to know him and trust was built. And she's had a flexible time now. She may move on to, to more permanent when she's ready. So it's that mentality of, is this a partner or is this someone who's going to do the work for me? I cannot tell you how many times I've heard people say, I can't find sores. No, they can't find sores because what they want is product development people. What they want are engineers. They don't want somebody to actually do a sewing job because that they're not capable themselves of refining what they need into something that's doable. So anyway, to answer more than one question, how do we elevate this job of doing sewing into something else? Flexibility is one, and engagement's the other. It's just another side of the same coin, which is to ask the people that we're working with, what is it that can they make a contribution in some way? Can we listen to what is going on, to what is being said about the product, and giving them a hand and be part of all of that, and then actually giving up some of our own autonomy so that they help with decision making and they have buy-in. So these are these are not new ideas. These ideas have been out there for generations about how to engage a workforce. But because we don't have a consistent industry here that we can point to and say that's successful and that's a failure, we don't know what's going on. As Casey has said, we're so siloed from each other. So let's borrow from good writing about developing a workforce from 50 years ago, 30 years ago, and really go back and look at some of that stuff and say, how can we build an industry? How can we build? Another really key thing is standards. That's why Muses is so dedicated to the idea of apprenticeship, because it's built around standards. How do you elevate an entire industry? You do it by having standards for what you're doing so that you can hold up what you're doing and say, we're better than this. We do this. We follow these rules. We follow these. And we heard about it in all kinds of things like blue sign dyes and OECO text. Certification for the materials, but what about for the labor? What about you say you can't find sewers? Part of the problem is you don't know what skills they bring to the table because you may not know what you're asking for. So building standards, and that takes a consortium of people to continue to develop standards. Our labor is a wonderful way to go through that. Sorry, I'm not on the panel, but I can just <laughs> yeah, can hear this question over and over and over again, and there are answers for it, and there's a system for making that happen. And come talk to me if you want to. Sorry. No, that's excellent. Thank you so much.